grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Happy Mother's Day again. It is important that we love and remember and thank those women in our lives. It's important. And I think that video really gets to something I want to acknowledge, though, on this day. That whatever relationship you have with the woman that gave birth to you, whatever that relationship is, he sees you and he's with you. Whether that woman gave you up for adoption, whether that woman hurt you, whether that woman is gone and you long to hug her one more time, whether you are that woman and you long to hug your child one more time, whether you are that woman and you wish you had a child to hug, whether you are in a family that is just full of joy and life and can't wait to see your mom and need your mom and so excited, wherever you find yourself on that spectrum, God sees you. There was a mom a long time ago in Genesis that said, my God is El Roi. God sees me when she was lost in the desert with her child. And God saw her. God sees you wherever you find yourself today. Amen? So with that in mind, we're going to take a little turn. I'm going to do a little twist. We were talking about moms of the Bible. If you saw the email that came out, we are going to talk about moms of the Bible. We're going to go through some of those scriptures, but we're going to look at, like Pastor Mark said, spiritual mothers, moms that raised people in the faith, moms that took women, not just moms, ma women who took that faithful step to lead people to Jesus, to God, to walk of faith. Uh, my wife, Emily, has an incredible biological mom. She's awesome. She's welcomed me in the family. She's an amazing mother-in-law. I am truly blessed. She loves Jesus, loves us. So Emily is doubly blessed when, oh, I need to go back, don't I? I need to talk about spiritual mothers. I need to define this. Let's, let's define this really quick. Forgot one thing. Spiritual mothers, a spiritual mother is what we're talking about today. This is the Seth Gierke translation and definition. A spiritual mother is a woman who by blood, adoption, family relation, happenstance, friendship, or completely orchestrated by God is entrusted with someone's faith development. So this is what we're talking about today. Spiritual mothers. Spiritual mothers. So Emily, this is young Emily, with her Aunt Lois, who uh, lived not far down the road in Austin where she grew up. And Aunt Lois was a highly awarded, very successful um, teacher, public school teacher in Texas, also a children's book author, amazing, amazing woman, loves Jesus. And, but despite all these accolades, she was one of Emily's spiritual mothers a very, very, very important spiritual mother. Emily's told me stories about how Aunt Lois would lay on the couch and, and, and Emily would lay on the, on the carpet in the living room and they would just talk about stories of the Bible or, and how they apply to her life. Or she'd bring up, you know, boy issues and Aunt Lois would help, help her counsel through that and walk through it like Jesus would with love and understanding. Emily had someone in her life who God entrusted into Aunt Lois's hands and trusted to her. And step by step, Aunt Lois walked with her through life. It's what, it's what spiritual mothers do. It's what we're called to do. So we're going to look at some spiritual mothers in the Bible today. We're going to jump right in. We're going to go to Exodus 2. It'll be on the screen. This is also the, I'm going to use the ESV translation, which is the same one in your pew. So if you want to pull that out, you can do that too and follow along. Exodus 2. I just also want to let you know, if you don't have a personal Bible of your own online or here, we'd love to give you one. Please see us. We'd love to put the word in your hands. So Exodus 2, let's start here. Now a man from the house of Levi... Levi, the house of Levi were the priests. They were the pastors, the worship leaders. They were the ones that interpreted the word for people, okay? He took as his wife another Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. 
And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. Because that's what you do with fine children. You hide them. Right? I thought you show them off, right? Don't you, don't you show off your babies? Now, let's back up. If you don't know what's going on here, right now, God's people, his chosen people, are enslaved in Egypt. They're enslaved. They've been there for 400 years in slavery under Pharaoh. Pharaoh, the smart man that he is, realizes that these Hebrew people, these Israelite people are growing in number, and he's worried about a coup, that these slaves will turn on him. So what, he, what does he do as a leader? Kill all the warriors. So he has all the young kids, all the young boys killed. And can you imagine that? It's just, can you imagine the, just the devastation? So what does a wise woman of God, a spiritual mother do? Hide him as long as she can. Hide him as long as she can. What does she do? When she could hide him no longer, she took from him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch, you know, like tar or sap to make it waterproof. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank because that's what you do with your baby that's three months old. Just see ya, buddy. <laughs> right? I mean, but, but it, think about it. What is she up against? She can either run and escape Egypt into the desert. She's a slave. They're going to run after and kill her. So that's out of the question. Two, she could hand him over to Pharaoh. And what's Pharaoh going to do? Dead, right? She's just taking the next faithful step of, I have to trust. I have to do something. Maybe, maybe God's grace will be on this baby and... You ever feel like that as spiritual mothers? <laughs> when you come to them, you're like, all I could do is, uh, all I've got is this. I don't know what the end's going to be. So what happens? Verse 4, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. She's like, go, follow your brother. See what happens. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Smart girl. Already thinking like a spiritual mother, Right? How can I care for this baby? How can I raise this baby in faith? How can I do this? She's already at young high school girls, already thinking like spiritual mothers. And so his sister stood at a distance when she opened it. I got to find my spot. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse? And Pharaoh's daughter said, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. We know that Moses' mother, later on in the Bible, we read her name is Jochebed. Jochebed was up against everything. She was up against a wall and she didn't have many ways out. She just had to take a chance. Because you see, spiritual mothers usually, I'm not going to say usually, always, really all you've got is the next faithful step. It's all you get. What's the next faithful step with the Lord? Because true faith in taking those steps takes risk. It always takes risk because it's, you can't control it. Right? Guys, do you have spiritual mothers that you go to? And they're like, well, I, I can just help you with this one thing because I don't know what that future is going to hold. We need spiritual mothers. That's what they do. They help us step by step. You see, there's another, there's another spiritual mother in this. An adoptive mother. Pharaoh's daughter. Did Pharaoh's daughter know Yahweh? The God, the creator that we, we worship? No. She worshiped her father who considered himself a God. Pharaoh was God. You worship me. Right? And so what did she do though? God used this pagan 
young woman for life. She chose life, and she took a risk too. Because guess what? She snuck this baby that was supposed to be killed, gave it back to a Hebrew woman that her God, her God and king and father, right, would, would wanted to be killed and give them back, let it be raised and grow up, and then bring it into her house. That's risky. But she step by step, she chose life, and God used it. God was using that for his good. Amen? One step at a time. Let's, let's jump ahead. All right. Ready? We got to do a little fast forward. We are in Egypt, right? They're in slavery. Let's fast forward. Boom, Moses grows up. Ten plagues. He leads them through the Red Sea. Boom. They're in the, they're in the wilderness for 40 years and they, and they have the tabernacle and they get the Ten Commandments and they get manna and all that kind of stuff. Boom. Then they're in the promised land of Israel and Moses dies. Joshua takes over the Jericho, they clear out all the bad people, and boom, the kingdom is Israel. Boom. Fast forward to David, or King of Saul, King David, King Solomon. The temple is built, and now Israel reigns as one of the most powerful countries in the world. And guess what they do? Kings of Israel get tempted by Satan. And just, if you can go there, because we're all good people, we can't go there. But think about the worst things of Las Vegas, underground Las Vegas with the dark web and multiply it by a thousand. And that kind of horrible stuff was going on in the temple, in the presence of Yahweh. They were doing horrible things. The kings were doing these things. You can read about it in here, by the way. At eight years old, King Josiah becomes king. Eight years old. Any eight-year-old boys in here? Any eight-year-old boys? I know I've got a 10-year-old right there. Any eight-year-old boys? No. Eight years old becomes king of the most powerful country. And by 16, he is clearing out all the temple, all the, all the idols, knocking down the pagan altars, and bringing people back to Yahweh. Because Yahweh was in his heart, and I'm sure being raised up by people who loved Yahweh. And in his early 20s, Josiah says, okay, now that we've cleared out these, the, all this junk and we're worshiping God again, know what we need to do? We need to clean out the temple. We need to bring it back. We need to bring it back and clean it out. So they go into the temple, and they're just getting rid of all the junk. They're tearing out all the idols. They're, they're bringing it back to the glory of Solomon. And in that process of cleaning it out, they find behind a wall a, a scroll, a book of prophecy that was written by a prophet long ago. And they bring it out and the Levites read it, worship leaders, the pastors, the priests, and then they're horrified. They bring it to Josiah. Josiah reads it. And it, what it does is this prophecy that they found hidden in the temple says, all these kings are going to turn against me. Israel is going to fall away. My people are going to worship pagan gods. And there's going to be consequence for your actions. And you know what King Josiah does? He tears his robes. He falls down weeping on the ground because he loves God and he loves his people. And he loves his temple and he doesn't want this to happen. And so what does he do? He needs counsel. He needs, he needs, some, uh, he needs some help to figure out what to do next. At that time, Jeremiah, who wrote Jeremiah and Lamentations, a well-known prophet, does he go to him? No. Does he go to other kings? Does he go to other leaders? No. He goes to a prophetess named Hulda, a wise woman, the one prophetess named in the book of Kings. And he goes to her for wisdom and counsel, a spiritual mother. We don't know if Hulda ever had children, it's, they're never mentioned. We know her lineage, but we know that she's well-respected and wise and knew the Holy Spirit. And this is what happens. 2 Kings 22. So Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam and Akbor and Shaphan and Asaiah went to Hulda the prophetess. So they, they took, Josiah sent them to Hulda. 
the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, son of Haras, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they talked with her. And she said to them, this is what she says to them from the Lord. She's interpreting this prophecy. You with me? Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. Who's that? King Josiah. Tell him. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants. All the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. So essentially she's saying, all the stuff that you've read, it's going to happen. The prophecy is true. Imagine that, that God would be faithful to his word. Huh. So she verifies that <laughs> to them. Because they have forsaken me and made offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, say this to the king. I have a word for him from the Lord. Who sent you to me to inquire of the Lord, say this to him. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. You have torn your clothes. You have wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. I've heard you, Josiah. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers. So you, when you die, right? And you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. Huldah, a prophetess named once. Huldah, a woman that probably just lived in faithfulness. She cared for those God entrusted to her. And then one day the king comes to her and says, I need you. I wonder, the Bible doesn't say it, but why would he go to her if he didn't already have somewhat of a relationship? Right? Could she already have been someone, a mentor, a, a spiritual mother to him? It kind of just makes sense, right? And he continued in his way of reforming the, the, the temple after it. And I'm sure he went back to her. Help me hear the Lord hold a you see, guys, we need spiritual mothers. Your mother, your biological mother might be a spiritual mother to you, and that's great. But there are women in this church that over the uh, almost 10 years that I've been here have become spiritual mothers to me that I need, I depend on, and I have grown as a leader and as a man of God because of them. Because when I go to them, they lead me to the Lord. When I bring them an idea for a sermon, they're like, what do you think about this? And they help me think through it. They help me take the next faithful step, and I rely on them. Josiah needed a spiritual mother, and Hulda brought the word and truth to him. The word of truth. So men, seek out spiritual mothers. They are a blessing. We have one last story from Luke. Sophie read it to us earlier, a little Christmas in May. From Luke 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favorable one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. Mary was a teenager when this happened, that God chose her to be a spiritual mother, and trusting the Son of God to a teenager to raise. Just amazing to me. And here's the other thing that we don't think about. Jesus was a scary, unplanned pregnancy. 
Women, if any of you have ever been through a scary, unplanned pregnancy, Mary knows exactly how you feel. She was not married, came on suddenly, without expectation. Her husband was going to, her fiance was going to divorce her and get rid of her. You know what? Joseph actually, culturally, should have killed her to keep honor for the family. It's what would have been required in that time. He was trying to be nice and just send her away. But he took the next faithful step and trusted the Lord. She took the next faithful step and said yes to this scary thing because God said, don't fear, I've got you. And then she walked through life with Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus being two or three years old? He was toddling around, you know, grabbing wood off his dad's workbench in the shop and Mary singing songs. We have, we have one of Mary's songs, the Magnificat it's called. Mary singing worship songs throughout the house, teaching her son the Psalms, right? Teaching her son the Psalms, who her dad is, who both of her dads are, his dads. Just joy, right? Trying to figure it out one step at a time. And then 33 years later, finding herself at the foot of a Roman torture instrument and her son nailed to it bleeding, dying, and she's helpless. Moms, have you ever felt helpless? Watching your kids, and you can't help them. You can't get them out of whatever they're in. But you don't leave them. Mary didn't leave Jesus. She was with him to the end. And if you feel like you're in a spot where you're trying to forgive yourself for messing up or you think you've made a mistake. Grace. You imagine Mary thinking, I must have messed up somewhere and my son's being killed. No, Grace. He's with you one step at a time. One step at a time. See, there's three things I think we, I really want you to take with you, spiritual mothers. High school women, young ladies, you can already be spiritual mothers because every woman has the capacity to be a spiritual mother because guess what? The Holy Spirit is inside you. He guides you. He leads you. There might be someone who just keeps showing up at your door, right? Those women at St. John that I kept calling and be like, hey, can I talk to you? Can you pray for me? They're like, Seth keeps calling me and calling me. It's like, God, it was entrusting me to them. And they said, yes, say yes when God calls you because God will entrust people to you, ladies. And they might not be your biological ones, even though those are too, by the way. And then finally, take just the next step. Can y'all say, take the next faithful step? Say that with me. Take the next faithful step. The next faithful step, that's all you get. So here's the most important thing, and I want to say it again to all you ladies out there, spiritual mothers and future spiritual mothers, biological mothers, adopted mothers, women who are being entrusted with people. It's not about your success or your failure. Can I tell you that again? It's not about getting it right or that you messed up. It's about faithfulness because you don't get to decide all you get to decide is are you listening and are you close with the Lord and seeking him and just doing your best to be faithful and lead them to Jesus one step at a time. You don't get to decide the rest. He does. All these women, right? Think about Jochebed. Jochebed didn't know what was going to happen when she put her baby in the river, but that's all she had. Next faithful step. Pharaoh's daughter didn't know if her dad was going to kill this baby that had been weaned and grown up and probably three or four by that time and bring him into the castle. But she chose life. Hulda didn't know if Josiah was going to heed her word. He could have gone off the deep end and be like, that lady's nuts. Nope. But he did. And Mary, <laughs> to raise the mother of God must have been just a daily faithful step, figuring it out with the Lord, one day 
at a time. Trusting. Amen. Gentlemen, what I'd like to do, maybe we can get a little pad going, you know. Um, could we bless the women around us? Could you raise your hands just in the direction of women around you, guys? You can put your hands up, just kind of toward women that are around you. And I'd like you, I'd like to bless them. And repeat after me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these current and future spiritual mothers. Thank you for these current and future spiritual mothers. Provide them with wisdom, love, and truth. May they love those you entrust to them. May they love those trust to them. Help them to take the next faithful step. Help them to take the next step. We love you, Jesus. Amen.